Hello everybody, welcome back to a brand new episode of Mega Projects. This one is all about palaces and also Soviets. Two things that happen to do great on YouTube. So maybe this video will be a winner. Even if not, well, the good news is that it's brought to you by Skillshare, an online learning community for creators with thousands of topics to explore across design, business, art, music and more. Skillshare is giving away a free trial of premium to help you explore your creativity. There is a link below. It was the greatest building that never was. A towering construction that was meant to exemplify the very best of the mighty Soviet Union. The Palace of the Soviets was to be a structure of grandiose proportions and prestige. Had it been built, this magnificent administrative center and congress hall would have been the highest building in the world, topped with an enormous statue of Lenin, because of course it was pointing staunchly out over Moscow. But with the German invasion of the Soviet Union in 1941, construction, which was still in its early stages, ground to a halt and never recommenced. It would have been the ultimate temple to Soviet power. But alas, it's just going to remain a forgotten but glorious dream. The Soviet Union was officially formed in 1922 with the Congress of Soviets, attended by delegations from around the new Union. It was here that Soviet politician Sergei Kirov first mentioned the possibility of a titanic Congress building. This would surely be needed because there was going to be a torrent of new inductees into the USSR. And they were all going to be super happy about it. Not really. Two years later, the nation went into mourning with the death of Vladimir Lenin, and the Soviet Union saw a great drive to immortalize the revolution revolutionary hero in various memorials. A temporary mausoleum was quickly installed to house his embalmed remains, but some thought things should go a lot, lot, lot further. Viktor Balakin, a graduate student of Vukhutimus, maybe, not sure on the pronunciation there, an art and technical school in Moscow, suggested placing the memorial at the top of a giant congress building that would sit at the site of the Christ the Saviour Cathedral near to the Kremlin. While nothing happened for nearly 10 years, this was an idea that planners eventually came back to. In 1931, the Soviet Union announced a competition to design the long-heralded Congress building. Preliminary proposals were sent out to 15 different workshops all around the USSR, but this was a design of utmost importance. And when the competition ended in May 1931, none of the designs were deemed worthy enough. Soviet rulers knew that they had to widen the net, and in July 1931, a second contest was announced that would be open to designs from all over the world. 160 separate architectural designs were submitted, 134 Soviet and 26 foreign, with the government managing to narrow it down to three proposals, two of which were from Soviet citizens, Boris Arafan and Ivan Zolotsevy, while the third was from little-known Hector Hamilton, a 28-year-old British architect living in New Jersey. The might of the Soviet Empire. Yeah, we might choose a design from the dude in New Jersey, of course. The three designs were returned to the architects who were encouraged to improve them where possible. Now, if this is starting to sound as drawn out as a season of Pop Idol, then do bear with me. We're only about halfway there. Oh god. Two further closed competitions were held, the first of which invited 15 design teams, while the second just five. Now, I have to be honest here, we can't say for sure how a final design was chosen, but after going from 15 designs to 160, to 3, to 15, to 5, well, a winner was finally chosen. But while all of this to and fro was going on the building of a grand new building, while well, the death sentence of another had already arrived. The destruction of the Christ the Saviour Cathedral may have been met with sadness by some, but for the Soviet regime who had instigated a vehement anti-religious campaign during the 1920s, there may have been a twinge of satisfaction to see this great house of God brought down to make way for the glorious palace of the Soviets. The cathedral was first picked bare of anything of value, with the gold dome proving to be particularly rewarding. On the 5th of December 1931, the cathedral, which had been consecrated just 50 years before, was dynamited and quickly reduced to rubble. And what mountains of rubble were left? It is said to have taken a full year to remove the remains of the church. Soviet projects. Moving as quickly as the five-year plan, well, this certainly wasn't.
With the rubble finally cleared away and the bizarrely complex series of competitions drawing to a close, a winner was chosen and announced to the world on the 10th of March 1933. The design by Boris Arthan, a Jewish Russian who studied architecture in Italy and had recently completed the House on the Embankment, a vast government building situated in Moscow, was chosen. On the condition that two neoclassicist architects, Vladimir Shulko and Vladimir Gafreich, joined the team. Unsurprisingly, IFN accepted and the project came to be known as the IFN Shulko Gelfrich Draft. It does, however, appear that a decision was made almost a year before with a letter that was later discovered written by Stalin to Lazar Kanovich, one of his closest confidants, in which the Soviet leader clearly stated that IFN's design was to be chosen. He even helpfully made a few suggestions, which were drive the main tower upward, like a column, make it as tall as the Eiffel Tower, or even taller, crown the column with a brightly lit hammer and sickle, place monuments to Vladimir Lenin, Karl Marx, and Friedrich Engels in front of the building. So essentially, he wanted to turbocharge the communist sentiment and make it a world beater in terms of size. Stalin even made a public speech in which he proclaimed, The Palace of the Soviets is a monument to Lenin. Don't be scared of height. Go for it. <laughs> Go for it, lads. You can get it done. Classic Stalin. I'm sure there must have been a small amount of professional pride being hurt in being told to change a design you had already put years of hard work into. But if IFAN had any reservation, he certainly didn't voice it. Good idea in the USSR. All of the changes that Stalin had suggested were incorporated into the final design. The tower, which had measured 260 meters in his first design, now stood at 415 meters. In case you're wondering, that's 115 meters taller than the Eiffel Tower, but nearly a quarter of this height would be thanks to the colossal statue of Lenin that would sit on top of it. Though we don't believe it was ever actually constructed, if it had been, it would have measured 100 meters in height and weighed over 6,000 tons, almost half as heavy as the entire Eiffel Tower. The outstretched arm alone would have measured 30 meters, with even the index finger totaling 4 meters. The vast main hall would reach 100 meters in height and have a diameter of 160 meters and a capacity of 21,000 seats. A smaller hall, known as the Little Hall in the Eastern Wing, could accommodate only 6,000 people. But this would not simply be awe-inspiring from the outside. It was also set to be one of the most technologically advanced buildings in the world, with high-speed elevators, air purification systems, and huge media screens. There was even talk of being able to transform the stage into a swimming pool at some point, though whether that made it into the final design, we aren't really sure. But if Stalin had said it would get in there, well, it would have got in there. And you know what? I can't be 100% sure because I wasn't alive during the 1930s. Shocking, I know. But I'll be willing to bet that some of these palace designers might have gotten their start with today's sponsor, Skillshare. Sounds likely. Skillshare is an online learning community for creators with thousands of topics to explore across the arts and social sciences. Everything from graphic design and animation to marketing skills to UX design to entrepreneurship. If you consider yourself a lifelong learner, and I think you probably should, and I think you probably do because you're watching a channel called Mega Projects, well, definitely check out Skillshare. Unlike some platforms where you have to pay for individual topics or classes, Skillshare's premium membership scores you unlimited access to every subject available on the platform. So you can discover new skills at your own pace, and it's pretty nice. Look, I'm someone who'll just jump into a particular part of a class, extract the information I need, and then leave. I mean, sometimes I watch the whole thing if I find it particularly good, but I'm just like, I want that little bit of information. And then I can go to another class and take that little bit of information. I don't have to pay for each individual class. It's fantastic. Uh, previously, I've mentioned classes that I've taken, a productivity class uh, on email, specifically on email from Alexandra Samuel. I also did a class on building good habits with Thomas Frank. Both of those are great, worth checking out. Join more than 8 million creators learning with Skillshare. Skillshare are giving away a free trial of premium membership to help you explore your creativity. And after that, it's just around $10 a month. So please check it out. There is a link below and let's get back to the video. The foundations for this gargantuan palace were completed by 1939. A perimeter of steel piles 20 meters high surrounded a concave concrete slab with concentric vertical rings, inside of which was where the vast majority of the palace would eventually sit. As of June 1941, the steel frame for the lower levels was in place, and eyes began to drift 
upwards to where this glorious structure would soon rise. Unfortunately, Stalin's one-time pal Adolf Hitler had some other ideas. On the 22nd of June 1941, the Nazi leader launched Operation Barbarossa, with over 3 million Germans eventually crossing over the border and quickly streaming through the Soviet Union. It was, and still is, the largest land invasion in history, and the Soviet Union quickly began to buckle under the pressure. The speed at which the Nazis crashed through the Soviet Union took many by surprise. Pumped up by Soviet propaganda, many assumed the German war machine could be halted far from any major cities. But, well, that turned out to be wildly ambitious. Propaganda tends to make things look better than they are. It quickly became apparent that the Red Army was failing. And with every mile with which the Nazis breezed through Soviet territory, it was another mile closer to Moscow. The skeletal form of the Palace of the Soviets remained, but the steel was soon hauled down to be used in defense efforts around the city. The building site was cordoned off, but remained heavily guarded. All eyes were now looking westward to the advancing German army. The battle for the Soviet Union pushed everybody to the extremes. As many as 20 million Soviet citizens died during the conflict, with 140,000 Soviet soldiers and over half a million Germans perishing as the hellish Russian winter set in. Heroic stands had been made at Leningrad, and in particular at Stalingrad, and soon Soviet forces were pushing the hated Nazis backwards. By early 1945, the Germans had been forced out of Soviet territory, and the long march on Berlin had begun as Soviet forces pushed them mercilessly backward. On the 2nd of May, the German capital was captured, and the European conflict quickly came to an end. The cost of the Soviet Union and its people had been catastrophic, and while there was certainly a sense of triumph, the USSR was a shattered land. There has never been any definite explanation as why the Palace of the Soviets was not completed, but with nationalistic fervor at its high point after World War II, we can only imagine the enormous costs associated with such a construction proved too much even for the mighty ego of Joseph Stalin. After the death of the Soviet leader in 1953, there was a brief spark of hope that the building would finally be completed, but in a different location on the outskirts of Moscow. Once again, a design contest was held. Don't worry, this one was short. Thought, but this idea was quickly scrapped. Once again, the daunting costs were a major issue. With the Soviet Union entering the Cold War along with a costly space race, there was simply not the money for the vast vanity project that had been envisioned. Instead of the Palace of the Soviets, the site was turned into, and wouldn't bet you wouldn't guess this one, an open air swimming pool. The Moscow Pool, which opened in 1958, sat on the very foundations that had been laid for the palace. So, probably not the glorious symbol of Soviet power that had been planned, but it was at least a very impressive swimming pool, measuring 129.5 meters in diameter. There is something comforting about a story that comes full circle. When the end of a tale brings you happily back to where it all began, you get this sense of completion. And good news, this is one of those tales. In 1990, the Russian Orthodox Church was granted permission to rebuild the Christ the Saviour Cathedral, and what better place than directly over where the Moskva Pool currently was, where the Palace of the Soviets should have stood, and of course, where the original cathedral had been. The bizarre merry-go-round was entering its final phase. Over a million people living in Moscow donated to fund the rebuilding of the cathedral, and construction was finally started in 1995. Five years later, a new and improved cathedral had appeared, and it was as if the past 70 years had just never happened. And that concludes the ambitious yet barely even started story of the Palace of the Soviets, a building that was set to be the envy of the world, a communist beacon whose flame could be seen far and wide. In the end, it all came to absolutely nothing. The steel frame never rose above the lower level and would eventually be put to use as makeshift bridges and tank obstacles. The designs we see of the Palace of the Soviets shows a structure that seems to be of a different era, a grandiose ode to a Soviet era that has come and gone. You couldn't possibly build such a building in the modern era, but as it happens, even in the afterglow of World War II, the Palace of the Soviets was seen as a step too far, the most glorious building that never was. So I really hope you found that video interesting. If you did, please do smash that like button below. Don't forget to subscribe. Brand new videos three times a week. And thank you for watching.